Happy Easter. It's great to be with you on this special day, but I must admit, it, uh, it's been five weeks since we've gathered together, and it's Easter for crying out loud. <laughs> I know it's not right to start out on a negative note, but we must at least state the elephant that's not in the room this morning and talk about what we're sacrificing. And I know that's all of us being able to be together. I don't think this has ever happened for any of us in our lives that we would go this long and then come up on Easter and not be together. Even with all the good ideas about how to celebrate Easter in light of social distancing and even with improving our quality online, I want to emphasize that it's not the same. No matter how well we adjust, it's just not like being together, not like gathering together. We're sacrificing more than our economy in order to save lives in our country and in our world. We're sacrificing gathering together. We could be in a country against our religion, and they told us we couldn't do it. We would sneak to do that. We would do that in secret at the risk of our lives. But we've given that up, and it's right for us to do that in order to save lives. But I'm just noting that we are making that sacrifice, and I am feeling it, maybe you're feeling it, especially on this day. I don't know about you, but I miss regular Easter experience. I miss the packed sanctuary. I miss always our greatest attendance of the year by far filling this room. I miss the faith in the voices as we sing our favorite Easter songs like we just sang. And as we shout out, he is risen indeed. And we hear the common agreement that so many together believe that Jesus is alive. Do you miss that this morning? Well, I do too. We all do all around the world. We're missing that on Easter Sunday. I miss the worship team and the preacher uh, animated, bringing their A game, uh, feeding off the crowd. I, I miss all of us wearing something colorful, taking pictures in the foyer, and it, family uh, gathering together uh, for dinner and enjoying the extended family together. These are all things that we're sacrificing. It may be another five weeks. It's been five. So we're allowed to stop and just say together, ugh, a collective gasp. It's difficult. It's a sacrifice that we're making. And we can embrace that this morning because we can then look for what God's doing. He loves to bring good from difficult things, right? And so maybe he's helping us have a deeper appreciation for what so many of us have taken for granted. I know that's happening for me. I cannot wait for the celebration we're going to have when we can gather again. I'll even let you sit in the gallery and the balcony sections of our auditorium. Just please come back and we'll be so happy together. God can help us also to refocus, to, to think, to imagine the full potential of our gathering together and then come back and be better than ever once we return. I hope you're praying for that. I am. God's using the difficulty of this situation to reform that and reshape that in me as we all come back together, hopefully very soon. Well, I know a shelter at home order cannot stop our personal Easter celebration any more than a stone could keep Jesus in the tomb. <laughs> and so despite our limitations, we can believe, we can celebrate the risen Lord Jesus Christ this morning on Easter Sunday. As I lead you in that, I want to take us to the Apostle Paul's uh, comments on the resurrection. Uh, even though it was later, the risen Lord Jesus appeared to Paul, and he never got over it, completely turned his life upside down. And he writes about this in many places, but in his letter to the Corinthians in chapter 15, he writes, and we can begin reading there in 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 3. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. We'll, we'll stop right there. That was the gospel that was recited, that was sung, that was passed along uh, to so many in the early church as 
it exploded all over the world. The essential gospel, when it's boiled down to its irreducible minimum, includes the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So the first thing we see from Paul is just that you got to include it, but also don't celebrate it by itself. Take it with the whole Easter weekend. To understand the gospel, you have to put Friday with Sunday. And when you put that together, you have what they put in their gospel tracts and what they made sure to share with every individual. And that was that Jesus rose on the third day, but also that he died for our sins on Friday. And so that's the first one I'd like to share is just the resurrection is part of the gospel and we have to teach it together as one package, one weekend, uh, the death of Jesus along with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When Jesus hung on the cross, he asked a question. He asked one of the most painful, heart-wrenching questions that's ever been asked. He cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when he asked that question, in that moment, his twisted body seemed like one big question mark against the heavens. And it represented, it raised in his tortured body the questions of humanity for so many years, not theoretical, not philosophical, but born in the crucible of suffering and death. He raised this question and so many other questions when he hung on the cross. But then on Sunday, when he rose in his resurrected body, he straightened out all the question marks into exclamation points. He answered all questions by his greatest miracle when he came out of the tomb, when he overcame death. And he's alive now forevermore. So another question we might ask is, how far can evil go when we think about evil with the plagues and the catastrophes and the natural disasters and we go on to greater evil like the atrocities and the world wars and holocaust and violent crime and sexual abuse and terrorism and all the rest of it. The question comes, how far can evil go? Well, it nailed Jesus to the cross It caused him to writhe in agony until he died. It put him dead in a tomb for one day, for two days. And then on Sunday morning, he said, no more, no more. He had paid for our sins. And then he went from the lamb to the lion. And that's how far evil can go. Jesus in perfect control of it, he conquered it in his own death. So you can see Friday, how it rolls into Sunday, how it makes an amazing gospel that was shared and has been shared and still shared all over the world, leading people to, to become uh, followers of Jesus Christ now for, for, for many centuries. Jesus is forever now worshiped as the one who was dead, but now is alive forevermore. Jesus' resurrection was the ultimate miracle. Now, when he was on earth, he did many miracles. And you can only imagine the people and the effect it would have on them when he would cause a paralyzed man to walk, when he would cause a blind man to see, when he would cast a demon out of people right in front of a crowd, when he fed a crowd with a little boy's lunch, when he walked on water, when he calmed the storm and stilled the waves and the wind and they obeyed him. And And when he turned water into wine and so many other miracles, it just proved that what he claimed to be was true and that what he taught was true. Now, of all those miracles, there is none greater than his resurrection, none greater than the fact that they killed him. He'd lied dead in a tomb and then he brought himself back to life. The ultimate miracle to confirm everything he claimed to be and everything he taught was true. And the greatest confirmation was Friday. You see, Sunday confirmed Friday. Friday worked. Friday, when he died on the cross for our sins, it was enough. It worked. It is sufficient to forgive. It is accepted by the Heavenly Father. It will cause your sins to be forgiven for you to pass through judgment. And all of that he taught, all that he believed, all that he did was confirmed when he came back to life on Sunday morning. It's one package, Friday and Sunday, And it all comes together as a part of the gospel. Now, that just gets us warmed up. Paul gets really going now. And we go back to the, the, his teaching on the resurrection. He starts mentioning people that the resurrected Lord appeared to. People that 
Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, encountered or revealed himself to, and we see that list beginning in verse 5, if you'll follow with me. 1 Corinthians 15 now in verse 5. And that he appeared to Cephas, that's another name for Peter, the apostle Peter, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then also to the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, and that's of course Paul, who's writing the Apostle Paul, as to one abnormally born, for I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me." As we approach this section of Scripture and start talking about individuals the Lord Jesus appeared to, I want to tell you, um, I believe the greatest rock song of all time is arguably Freebird by Leonard Skinner. I know there are many uh, opinions out there, but for me, that is the greatest rock song. And the lyrics are familiar to many of us. The last part says, If I stay here with you, girl, things just couldn't be the same. Because I'm free as a bird now, and this bird, and many of you know, this bird cannot change. Lord knows I can't change. And this is where the song gets really good. If you like the song, the music starts to pick up and and get faster, and it's one of the best rock songs ever. uh, But those lyrics are extremely familiar. They're honest, and I would say this morning that I completely agree with them. We cannot change ourselves. The idea that we can't change that's in that song is true. You see, it's always two steps forward and then three steps back or ten steps back, and we don't have to hide that. We don't have to fake that we can change. We can embrace that truth that we cannot change because that's just the way it is. We can freely admit that we get stuck in bad habits, dysfunctional relationships, and self-destructive behavior. So many lives prove this, and so many are faking if they're not honest enough to admit this. And you see, this brings glory to what Jesus, the risen Lord Jesus Christ, did when he appeared to individual people and actually did change their life, actually did what no one else can do for themselves. And so we'll see that one person after the next. Now, we shouldn't be surprised. He was the one who overcame death, which is also something that no one has ever been able to do, that he would come along with the same power that overcame death and be able to do something else that no one has been able to do, and that is actually change a life. I mean, really change it. Only Jesus Christ can do that. Only the risen Lord Jesus Christ, and we see that over and over in these individuals who were privileged to experience the risen Savior and to have him appear to them. Peter was the first one, but uh, Paul gives quite a list. Peter, the 12 disciples, more than 500 brothers and sisters, James, finally Paul himself. We could add Mary Magdalene and the other ladies in John 20 that were there on Easter morning and saw the tomb, and Mary thought he was the gardener until he revealed himself to her, and she was never the same. How about the two men walking on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24, and Jesus comes along and disguises himself, starts telling them how he's in the Old Testament, and then he's sitting with them breaking bread, and they finally discover who it is, and they're hearts were burning within them. And then we have John, the apostle John, in the first chapter of Revelation. He actually sees the risen Jesus, tries to describe him, what he was like, and it's the most amazing vision. Quite a list of people who were privileged to see Jesus, the risen Jesus, hear him, touch him, experience, encounter him before he went back to heaven. The risen Savior changed their life. And he still changes lives today. Peter had failed miserably. We'll start with him. The night before Jesus died, we all know the story. Standing in the courtyard of the high priest just after Jesus was arrested and was about to be tried there, he was too afraid to admit that he even knew Jesus to a young slave girl. 
And he had his great failure, went out and he wept bitterly. And a few days later, after Jesus rose again, he met Peter on the beach and he restored him. In that encounter, he restored him. And what happened with Peter? As a result, he went out on the day the church was born, on the day of Pentecost, he preached the sermon, after which 3,000 people came to faith and were baptized. The same Peter who couldn't admit he knew Jesus to a young slave girl, preached in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, and 3,000 people came to faith, and the church was born. Then Peter goes back in the temple every day, teaching crowds of people. The authorities grabbed him, arrested him, beat him, told him never to do it again. He goes right back in the temple and keeps right on teaching every day. He said, we have to obey God rather than men. Same Peter but he had encountered the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And I wanna tell you, that's not micro change, that's macro change. That's not Peter trying to change his life or being told by a minister that he needs to change his life. That's a change only the risen, risen living Lord Jesus Christ can make. You know, there's a lot of evidence for the resurrection, but there is no greater evidence for the resurrection of Jesus than the changed lives of the people to whom he appeared. If you've loved the resurrection for many years, you know that's true. The greatest evidence for the resurrection of Jesus is the changed life of the people to whom he appears. No question. And that's still true. What we see with Peter Jesus has done for millions of people through the centuries, made a change and people notice and they say, there's no way you did that. Only Jesus Christ could make that kind of change. And all of a sudden for them, Jesus becomes real. It becomes the greatest evidence that encourages their faith and they experience Jesus and their life is changed. James grew up all his life as Jesus' little brother. Same family, same carpentry business, same hometown of Nazareth. And all this time, James never believed in Jesus, his older brother. Never believed in, in him, at least until after Jesus died. And then Jesus rose again and appeared to James. And then James believed. Even after all that time being so close to the pre-risen Jesus, he did not believe. But when the risen Lord Jesus appeared to his brother James for the first time after a long and wasted life, he began to believe and he was changed. He became the leader of the early church in Jerusalem. He wrote one of the favorite books of the Bible and he was willing to die for his brother Jesus as a martyr in AD 62. That's what happened to James. What about you? Have you spent a good portion of your life not believing in Jesus, but maybe you have some people you know who do believe? Well, I'll warn you, Jesus may arrange the circumstances of your life, some sort of crisis to get your attention, and then he may appear to you and change all of that because he's bigger than your unbelief. He's bigger than all the sin and all the way that you've thought and all your strong opinions that have led you to this point in your life. Jesus can turn all of that around, and he's done that many times. He's the only one who can turn a life around after it's been lived wrongly for a long time. He conquered death so he can change a life no matter what it's like. And he certainly did that for his brother, James. James didn't change himself. James didn't try to do a few more good deeds or try to break a few bad habits. Come on. The risen, living Lord Jesus Christ made him a whole new person. And that's what we celebrate on Easter. Jesus is not dead. He's alive. And you know what he's doing every day? You know what's just another day at the office for him? Changing lives like yours, like mine, in a way that everybody sees it and goes, there's no way that that could have happened by any other means than Jesus really being who he says he is and being alive. And that's what he did with his brother James. How about the disciples, the 12 disciples, 11 now, because Judas had died. The disciples were hiding in the upper room after Jesus died. They were hiding behind locked doors and paralyzed by fear, paralyzed by guilt, paralyzed by discouragement. They had deserted Jesus and they knew it. They deserted him when he needed them the most. They were scared to death that, that the ones who had just crucified Jesus would come and get them and they would be next. They were about to go back to their original vocations before they began to follow Jesus. And Jesus walked right through that locked door with his resurrected body and he breathed the Holy Spirit on them and gave them peace. 
It's not hard or it's not easy to come. It's not easy to come into a group of 11 discouraged, fearful, guilty men and turn that completely around. They needed more than a pep talk and they got more than a pep talk. They got Jesus. They got the risen Lord Jesus walked in the room. Look what he did. Eleven ordinary men. How could we deny this? They're not just one person's testimony. Simultaneously, eleven very different, very ordinary men experienced all the same experience of the risen Lord Jesus. And look what happens to them. After this encounter, they all go out and become martyrs for Jesus. They were all willing to give their lives up for Jesus, spreading the gospel, leading the early church, rejoicing to suffer for his name. Now, was this for something they believed? Absolutely not. This was not for something they believed. This was for something they saw. This was for something they heard, they experienced. They ate meals with the resurrected Lord Jesus after they knew he died and they never got over it. And we see the result in their life. They were never the same again. They witness firsthand his resurrected body, and they all go out and become the most compelling evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, the resurrection either either happened like they said it did, or they were lying. And why would they all lie and then give up their lives? Why would they all become martyrs for a conspiracy, for a lie? Would a lie change their lives? Would a lie change so many of the lives of the people who believed, who followed them as the church exploded around the world? Absolutely not. The greatest evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ was the change in the life of the people to whom he appeared, just like his disciples. Finally, Paul, who's writing this, shares his own encounter The Apostle Paul, he's so excited listing these people, and he can't wait. He puts himself last, but he can't wait to tell his story. He was a religious leader. He was zealous. He was hardworking, and to protect his Jewish faith, he was rounding up Christians in this early group of Christians and throwing them in prison and and presiding over their martyrdoms and their death. He was actually killing Christians. His effort was exemplary. He, ex- he excelled all of his contemporaries. But all of it was going in the wrong direction until he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. Jesus basically knocked him off his donkey and blinded him and gave him a whole new view, a whole new vantage point where everything he considered to be important now he considered rubbish. And he realized it was all, all wrong. And, and, and Jesus Christ turned him completely upside down. And as a result, he changed his name. He was Saul. And now he, he called him Paul. He's like, you're such a different person now. I'm going to give you a different name. And even though you were killing so many of my people, you were persecuting me, Jesus said. Now you're going to go and you're going to become the greatest missionary taking my gospel all over the world. And you're going to write half the New Testament, 13 of the 27 books. You're going to write them, Paul. You, Mr. Persecutor of the church, you'll always be humble. You know who you were before you met me. But now, now you'll be its greatest evangelist, its greatest missionary, and you'll write half of the Christian New Testament. And it'll be a testimony the whole time that I, the risen Lord Jesus, have changed you, Mr. Zealous religious leader. I completely changed you. And so much so that you are ready for a new name. You're ready for a new name. And this is the point. Jesus can change you so much that you'll want to change your name. And there's no, no one of us that can change ourselves. We can't even make progress in our life. And Jesus comes along, he says, I'll make you whole new person. And what I'm telling you has happened for millions of people. Believe it with all my heart, it's happened in my life. Jesus can make macro change when we can't even make micro change. And when he does, it's our life. We will enjoy it the most because we live in our life for 24 hours a day. And so we'll know it, we'll experience it, and we'll thank Jesus more than anyone else for the change only he can bring, the risen Lord Jesus Christ can bring when he appears to us. Now there's one more, and I didn't, it's not in the passage, but I have to include this. The risen Lord Jesus appeared to the apostle John in all his glory. And I just want you to see this glimpse of what the risen Lord Jesus really looks like. He described this in Revelation 1, verse 14 through 18. This is the apostle John seeing Jesus, and this is what he described him to look like. The risen Lord Jesus, not the lamb, the lion, the glorified, resurrected body 
risen Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to the description in Revelation 1, 14 through 18. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were like blazing fire. (laughs) And his feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters, and his In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. And then he placed his right hand on me, and he said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now, look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. And after John recovered from this vision, he wrote the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible. And so yet one more example, and on and on we could go. Jesus is alive today. He's still making personal appearances to his people. And now he does this through the miracle of faith. And Peter describes this because, see, for most of us, we don't see these visions. We don't get to touch Jesus. We don't get to eat meals with him. We experience him, and we have a a similar life change, but it's through faith. And Peter describes the one who had this life-changing encounter with Jesus, describes this in his letter, 1 Peter 1 verse 8, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. Look, Look at the effect. There's still that effect. Why? Because we're experiencing such a change and we're loving who we see. And this whole uh, encounter is so amazing that we can't even describe the joy that we're experiencing. That is available to all of us by faith. And millions of people have encountered Jesus and experienced macro change through faith, not seeing him, not hearing him not touching him, not sitting down eating meals with him, and yet still having their lives completely changed. Give him a new name, brand new. can happen by faith. You see, very few people today believe because of Peter or, or because of uh, John or James or Paul, any of these others, the disciples. That's not why so many people believe. They believe because they've seen the change in their father, in their mother, in their wife, in their husband, in their son, their daughter, their brother, their sister, their neighbor, their coworker, their friend. They see the change and they look and they go, I want that. That made Jesus real to me. And now by faith, the evidence in your life has encouraged my faith. Now I'm going to put my faith in Jesus. So it is that Jesus wants to change your life. And then when he changes your life, it'll get the attention of someone else. And they'll believe in Jesus because they can't deny the evidence of your life. And this is how... And I'll just say today on Easter, maybe God has arranged the circumstances in our world right now, maybe the circumstances of your life to get your attention. And maybe he wants to appear to you. And if he does, I'll tell you, don't resist it. You'll love it. You'll love it. It's so much better. Every day is a thousand times better than days anywhere else. He'll change you. You won't be perfect, but you will be different. So different that it proves that he exists. Let him do this for you. Um, Pray, ask him to to show himself, to reveal, to appear to you. You can pray that. And then when he does, then, then, then just thank him for dying for your sins. Start at the beginning of the gospel and say, well, thank you for Friday that you died taking the punishment for my sin. And, and I receive that. I need that. I'm a sinner. And then you can go further and ask him to come into your life to forgive your sin and then to completely change you, to lead you, to be real to you. So real, the world will see it. The world will want to call you a different name. You can do that right now. You can say that prayer to Jesus just between you and him. But then as that change takes place, you can't keep that a secret. Tell somebody and ask them to help you grow in your new identity. Well, I know that was the main message that I had for this morning, but... In closing, I want to give one last point, one last reason we celebrate the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And that's not only does his resurrection fit in the gospel, not only does it bring life change, 
but his resurrection guarantees our resurrection. Our resurrection. Now, there's not time to explain or read the verses that are in the rest of 1 Corinthians 15, but you can read it. It goes on to describe how his resurrection was the first fruits, and then there would be all those who died believing in him, and then after that, all who belonged to him. And then it goes on and describes, and here's what your resurrected body will actually look like, and it's talking about the mystery of the change that we'll go through, and I'll just say, it's real. It's going to happen. If you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you can celebrate that his resurrection will change your life now. But it will also guarantee your resurrection when you die. It's real. And this is hugely important because we're all going to die. And there are no other good offers for our death. Of course, other religions speak about death, and they give opinions, and they'll say, well, we're going to come back as something different, we think. Or if you do really well, it'll go, it'll go well for you in the future. I don't know what it looks like, but we'll speak vaguely about it. But, you know, there's a lot of people, we don't know what will happen. We're just curious. We're hopeful. We're, you can't know anything. It's just a nothing. And, 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 and it, it amazes me because if you study history, we're going to be dead a lot longer than we're going to be alive. And so if a religion is worth anything, it should address death, not just life. And this is the point. We should evaluate a religion not just based on what it says about life, but on what it says about death. I don't care what a religion offers me about my life if it's not talking to me or helpful to me about my death because I am going to die. We're all going to die. We don't have to put that out of our mind and consider that to be morbid. Something that obvious, something that inevitable, we must address. And a religion should have a strong answer, not a vague answer for that challenge. And there is only one religion. There is only one religious leader who took that on like Jesus did, who helped us in such a powerful and obvious way, who basically said, I offer to bring you back from your death. I offer to give you resurrection from the dead if you believe in me. Now, I know it's hard for you to believe that, so I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to die, and then on the third day, I'll come back to life, and I'll prove to you that I can do that. Are you ready? It's like a prize fighter. He called the round where he would defeat the champion. And sure enough, they put him to death, and three days later, he came back. He came back to life. And he promises through that to overcome our death. You see, this isn't just included in the Christian faith. This is the main thing. It's not a vague explanation of what someone thinks might happen in the afterlife. It's an historical event with huge evidence to back it up. Where other religions put hopeful guesses, Christianity puts its greatest miracle and its most popular holiday. And that's why we're so excited about Easter, because we're all going to die. And Jesus right up front says, I got that covered. I died. I brought myself back. I have the power to overcome your death. Come with me. And you too will rise again when you die. If that doesn't excite you, oh my goodness. Even if we're apart, we can get excited personally and with our families about that truth. Jesus, the only sure guarantee of our resurrection when we die, and we will die. I know this week I was listening to my daughter, Joy, who has been teaching all week online to her quilting community, and she used this illustration, and I told her, I didn't even ask her permission. I just said, I'm going to steal it from you and honor your father, so get over it. And, uh, but she used this illustration because she's worried and a lot of people are worried about getting pneumonia from Corona and, and, uh, wondering if they'll die or those that they love will die. And, um, this is, this is the illustration she used. You can see, obviously we have a door here. Everyone is going to die eventually. And we're afraid of that because we don't know what our death's going to look like. We're not sure what it's going to be exactly, and so we just are kind of afraid. And it's like this door. We all have to go through this door one day, and we're doing everything we can not to go through it. And I know I'm right there. Life is that way. Every ounce of it resists dying, and so we don't want to talk about it, and we don't want to ever experience it, but we know in the back of our mind that we're all one day going to have to walk through this door, and it's terrifying. And then Jesus comes along and he says, you know what? I'll walk through that door and forever and eternity, you'll glorify me as the one who died 
and is alive again forevermore. So Jesus walked through this door, and then he came back three days later, and he looked at us and he said, when you go through this door, don't worry, I'll be on the other side. When you come through this door, don't worry, I got you. What other religious leader makes that offer? And isn't that our greatest need, our sin, our death? He gave us his cross to forgive our sin. He gave us his resurrection to say, hey, don't worry when you die. I know it's going to be a fearful, painful, mysterious, kind of strange experience, but don't worry. I'm strong enough to overcome my own death. I'll overcome yours. You can trust me when you die. And for that, we celebrate on Easter. We celebrate our Lord Jesus Christ for overcoming not only his own death, but ours. He can change our life, but he can also overcome our death. What an offer. What an offer from our risen Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, it's a wonderful thing. Well, the interesting thing now, I want to lead all of us in communion. He didn't pick any of this as the picture that he wanted us to look at. When he said, hey, I want you to remember me until I come back. He didn't pick his glorified body. He picked the body that was nailed on the cross. He he didn't pick himself being the lion. He picked himself being the lamb because he said, when you remember me, I want you to remember how much I love you. And that's Friday. That's when that came. And that picture that shows the quality of his love and how much he desires to forgive our sin, that all came in on Friday. And so the picture he wants us to look at until he comes back is is not his resurrection, but his death on the cross. And so we have before us our way of remembering that, our way of looking at that picture and being blessed by that love and by that grace this morning. He took bread the night before he died and he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. Church, go ahead and partake. had dinner, he held up the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant, the new testament in my blood. His blood that was shed for us. He wants us to remember that. He loves us. He can forgive our sin, change our life. And so we remember, he said, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We love you, Jesus.